No. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, What's New in Historical Fiction, a regular panel series that features historical novelists with new and upcoming titles. Um, I'm so excited to, to uh, welcome these authors today, and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves in a second here. Uh, first, let me tell you about myself, and also I'm going to tell you about the features of Crowdcast. So my name is Colin Mustful. I'm the founder and editor of an independent press called History Through Fiction, and we publish uh, historical fiction novels. Um, this panel is a regular series. Our next one will be in, in August, and I'll have more information about that later. But uh, if you want if you want to stay up to date on that, just follow us on Crowdcast, and you'll get information about all of our events here. Uh, so just real quick, if you haven't used Crowdcast before, there are several features. As some of you have probably seen, there is a chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. On the bottom right, it says, say something nice. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and do that? Say hello, let us know where you're joining us uh, from, maybe something that you're reading, um, anything like that. Um, on the bottom, we have a polls button. I didn't actually put in any polls. We do have an ask a question feature. So if you have a question for any of the panelists at any time, please use the ask a question feature on the bottom of the screen to ask that question. And then even if you don't have a question, you can open that up and, and vote for the ones that, that you want me to ask. Um, there is a green button that says get your book now. Um, if you haven't gotten the, the books by these panelists, you can click that link and it'll take you to a landing page with all of their books. And uh, then you can, can purchase their, their books. Uh, there's also a donate button. Some people have donated and I really appreciate that. We are an independent press uh, on a minimal budget and it really just helps offset the cost of, of the platform, of the Crowdcast platform. So thank you for those that have contributed. Um, okay, without further ado then, I'm gonna to welcome our panelists here. Uh, Angela Jackson Brown, let's start with you. Uh, why don't you tell us about yourself and, and if you could read an excerpt from your novel. Excellent. Thank you so much for this invitation. I am so happy to be on this panel with these amazing authors. So my name is Angela Jackson Brown, and I'll be joining the creative writing faculty at Indiana University in Bloomington in the fall as an associate professor. I'm a playwright and the author of a collection of poems called House Repairs and the author of three novels, Drinking from a Bitter Cup, When Stars Rain Down, and the upcoming novel, The Light Always Breaks. So tonight I'll read to you a short excerpt from The Light Always Breaks. You are quite the efficient hostess, a deep voice said behind her. Eva turned and saw a very handsome and debonair looking man standing a breast distance from her, looking at her with a familiarity that almost made her snap something rude at him. But she reminded herself that he was a guest and she couldn't allow him to get to her in any more than any other man in the room. The unknown man was well over six feet and he cut quite the figure as he leaned lightly on a walking cane. Eva wasn't sure if the cane was for getting around or for adding to his overall persona. A thick lock of dark curly hair hung down over his left eye in an almost rakish fashion and he was sipping on a glass of dark liquor while all the while admiring her with his eyes. He reminded Eva of the actor John Payne or perhaps Tyrone Power. He was wearing the standard tuxedo, but nothing was standard about how he looked. Eva could not help but to admire how well the suit seemed to mold to his body. Clearly it had been tailor-made for him. Realizing she'd been staring at the stranger for quite some time, Eva cleared her throat with an embarrassment. I. Do I know you, she asked, finally settling on something to say. The man took a sip from his glass and laughed. No, but I sure would like for us to get to know each other. Eva blushed. This is a private party, sir, so if I don't know you, that means you weren't invited. He smiled and let me introduce myself so maybe I can get on your A-list. My name is Cortland Hardiman Kingsley IV. He extended a hand, but she ignored it. That was lovely. Thank you, Angela. And um, I don't know if Clifford is putting us on, but he says it's your birthday. So happy birthday. 
Um, next, let's go to uh, Vanessa Riley. Um, if you could introduce yourself and um, tell us about your book and read an excerpt for us. Okay. My name is Vanessa Riley. Um, I'm the author of 21 plus books. So they're, my books are now old enough to drink. Um, I got started in historical fiction and currently I publish in both historical fiction, uh, historical romance. I publish in historical romance, historical fiction, and coming up in the fall, historical mystery. Um, today was the paperback release of the hardcover last year for Island Queen. Um, it's got, uh, discussion questions. So if you guys have book clubs out there, this is an excellent, um, uh, uh, read. But today I'm going to be reading from you my novel, which releases on July 12th, Sister Mother Warrior. This is about the two women who shaped the Haitian Revolution, Abadoya Toya, who is a Dahomey warrior, who literally teaches the, the fighting skills that are needed for the Haitians to, uh, the, the Santa Domingue people to overthrow the French masters. And then you have Marie-Claire Bonnier, who I believe is the first battlefield nurse predating Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole. Um, she becomes the empress, the wife of the man who uh, led the rebellion, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. So you have war and power in this book. And tonight's excerpt um, will be the naming ceremony. So to give, just to give you a quick background, Abadar's village has been overrun by the Dahomey. And literally the king will go and put his hand over the women that he wants to choose to join the Dahomey. So you're either become part of the tribe or you're, you're going to go to Ouida. And Ouida is where they're going to sell you to the Europeans who are coming for slaves. Uh, she has survived that. She's been chosen. And now it's the naming ceremony. Gal Hangby led me to the babbling stream at the center of camp. My sisters, my soon-to-be sisters, danced and ate the feast, the roasted fruits and hearty stew that scented the air. Creamy white chameleon beads straddled my hips, forming an apron that protected my womanhood from the spitting ash. The fire will greet you, she said. The beating of her hat, her breastplate jiggled when she leaned forward, warming her hands over the flames that glowed red like red blood. Take the leaf from your mouth, Abadar. She said, give it to the flames, then we shall know your new name. Holding my breath, praying to retain a bit of the old, I did as she asked. In seconds, the leaf ignited, licked away to nothing. Sparks hissed as the logs offered mournful crackles, then all dulled, silence. Had the gods rejected my offerings? Everything, everything celebrating the completion of our training of becoming Amino stilled. It felt like the world would end before Gao raised her arms. You shall be called Abadar, Abadaria Toya. My leader's voice sounded strangled, but my cheeks began to burst. I had something of the old. I kept my name, most of it. Thank you, Gao. Thank you. Dancing and singing began anew, but the woman I idolized frowned as if the sky had fallen. Do not be thankful for a curse. Abadaraya means torn apart, torn away. You shall be torn away from all you know. Thank you, Vanessa. I, I love to hear the, how, you, how you read that. You. And also congratulations on the Island Queen. I, I had no idea the paperback release was today. Well, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Oh, well, next, let's go to uh, Kimberly Brock. Um, you could introduce yourself and read an excerpt from your novel for us. Well, how do I follow up that from Vanessa Riley? 21 books. That's amazing. I'm, I'm so fangirling up with this whole panel tonight. I feel like I just need to sit back and listen. I'm, I'm overwhelmed a little bit. I am Kimberly Brock. Um, I am an Atlanta-based author, so I'm near Vanessa. And um, this is my second novel. My first novel published nine years ago. The River Witch was my first novel. It was a Georgia Author of the Year winner for debut, and it was a Southern literary fiction. This is my first historical fiction, but it is also a Southern literary-leaning book club historical 
women's fiction, I would say. It's very much like you're, we're just steeped in the estrogen tonight around here, I think. Um, and it is called The Lost Book of Eleanor Dare. So I'm very excited about this. And um, my background is in, I was actually a special needs teacher for a little while. I was a theater major in college and just sort of accidentally became a published writer. I'd always been scribbling and writing, but publication, you know, that seemed like a big dream. So it's amazing to me to be sitting here tonight with an actual book in my hands. I still think that's amazing. So I'll read just a little excerpt. This book has um, two mysteries in it. The Lost Colony of Roanoke, North Carolina, um, is a background mystery. And then there's a family of women 16 generations later who believe that they may have descended from one of the survivors um, of that colony. And um, the, her story, Eleanor Dare, she was the mother of Virginia Dare, the first English child born in the new world. And there's a lot of speculation in this novel about whether that's true or not. Um, but it's about the, a mother and daughter trying to decide what they think about the stories that have been passed through the women in their family. So I'm actually going to read tonight from Eleanor's tale, which doesn't actually begin to the middle of the book. And it's kind of a fable that the mothers tell their daughters in this story. Eleanor's tale, London, spring, 1585. They say... There are no real mysteries left in the world. No silver scaled dragons of the air. No fantastic lurking monsters in the deep. Nor invisible people of the wood. But Eleanor White could have told you with certainty that these things were real. She'd seen them in her father's sketches and watercolor paintings. An artist who traveled beyond the map and came home to tell all of London of the beasts of the sea and native people, the painted men and women he lived among. Her father kept her away from his work when she was young. She lived alone with him in the house on Fleet Street and was without him when he left for months on his travels. The house was divided in half, half they lived in, while the opposite side was a studio that housed the wonders he'd witnessed. He had added these rooms the year her mother died. And in this way, he never had to leave his work. He curated an exquisite gallery where he entertained important guests, dignitaries of state, and lords and ladies would pay to see his most unusual collection of sights unseen and fund further expeditions to the world he was discovering. Known for his former work as a limner, Eleanor's father had once made a fine living painting the most lifelike miniatures. But a man can get lost in such detail. And when the sudden deaths of his beloved wife and young son shocked him and left him faithless, and he might have drawn comfort in his remaining only daughter, instead, he locked himself away and soon found himself standing at the great precipice of his grief. Unable to continue the work of portraiture, he set out on voyages to the new world, for he could no longer live in the one he had known. The work was dangerous but necessary, and it was then he fell in love with shorelines and mountain ranges and star charts that could always be depended upon to guide a man's next step. He was charting a sure and certain future, so no man would ever have to know the kind of uncertainty he'd known. But secretly, it was Eleanor who wandered through her father's forbidden gallery. She barely noticed his maps. Her curiosity led her to her father's paintings. For what Eleanor longed for most was not the destination, but to catch a thrilling glimpse of the unknown.
Thank you, Kimberly. That was so touching. I got goosebumps. Um, let's, next, let's move on to uh, Aaron Lidekin. Um, if you could uh, tell us about yourself and, and your book. Sure. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Is this working now? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Had some technical difficulties earlier. Um, my name's Aaron Lidekin. I am a, this is my debut novel. So I'm a bit awestruck to be here with you wonderful ladies. Um, definitely adding to my TBRs. I can't wait to hear read more about your books, Angela and Vanessa. And Kimberly, I've read your book and loved it. So huge fan. Um, so my book, The Memory Keeper of Kiev, is uh, a historical fiction dual timeline based on the Holodomor, which was a man-made famine that Stalin implemented in the 1930s that killed roughly 4 million Ukrainians. So it's the story of Katya and how she survives that Holodomor. And then what she does with that history, how she buries it to, sur to, to survive, to move on with her life, all the tragedy she went through. And then generations later, her granddaughter has to help her rediscover that history so that they can move forward with their lives, move past their grief. And so it's a story of you know love and loss and, and hope after grief and it's something we can all relate to. Um, and I have Ukrainian roots in my family. And so that's kind of where it stemmed from. My, my interest in Ukraine started with my great grandmother and the stories she tell me. So. Um, I will read a little excerpt for you. And to set the stage for this scene, um, as the villagers, as activists, groups of activists came into the village, they would requisition grain and food to fill the new quotas that Stalin was implementing as he collectivized the farms. So in this scene, uh, a group of activists um, comprised of a local villager and some Soviet Russians are visiting Kati and her family. A sharp click echoed in the room and everyone froze. The Russian's cocked pistol pointed at Tato. Are you resisting orders? If you are, we will have to label you an enemy of the people. We all know what happens to enemies of the people. I could shoot you right now. Nobody would care. Katya's head buzzed. All the anger she'd felt morphed into sheer terror as she stared at her Tato. His beet red face glistened with sweat and his hands curled slowly into fists, the anger crackling off him like a hungry fire seeking fuel. If somebody didn't intercede, he would be shot for attempting to murder Prokip with his bare hands. Mama, too, saw his inner struggle. She stepped in front of Tato and spoke calmly. I apologize for my husband's behavior. He's overprotective of his daughters. He didn't mean what he said. We'll cooperate. The Russian smirked and lowered his gun. Dropping Alina's hand, Katya pulled her father into a hug and spoke in his ear. Please, Tato, there's no harm done, but we can't lose you. Please. She felt the tension lessen from his body, but vibrations of anger still throbbed like the veins on his neck. Prokip watched the scene with amusement, then sauntered back over to his cohorts, smiling. The Russian turned to him and asked with complete sincerity, have you been offended by this man? What would you like to do, comrade? Prokip glanced at Tato and then at Alina, who was as white as a sheet, but holding her head high as Mama had taught them. Katya's legs wobbled, so she locked her knees and held her breath as they waited for this fool to decide the fate of their family. I suppose I can overlook it this once, as long as he and his family promise to cooperate fully in the future. His gaze lingered on Alina, but we shall have to check back here often to make sure they're behaving. Another activist pushed into the house with a large sack of wheat balanced on his shoulder. I found this and another hidden, just like it in the, bar, in the barn loft. Katya's heart sank. She'd worried the wheat in the barn wasn't hidden well enough, but Tato thought it safe out of sight behind the hay. You can't take that, Tato shouted. It's my seed for planting this fall. This will pay your quota for now. The Russian waved a hand dismissively as if suddenly bored by them. Come, we must move to the next house. The woman cast an apologetic look towards Mama and hurried behind the men as they left. The door swung wildly in their wake, and none of them moved until Tato strode forward and slammed it shut, though not before Katya saw the activist's cart stacked high with sacks of grain, just like the one they'd taken from their barn. Thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah, so important to share history like that. And I see you've got the Ukrainian flag there in the background, and there's that, that wheat in, in your jar there. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's actually a picture my great grandmother embroidered of the Ukrainian trident, the, their state symbol. Yeah. Nice. Well, I've got a lot of questions for all of you. There's a lot of important history, a lot of uh, things, you know, regarding historical fiction and, and how you turn that, that history into into a story. Um, so I'll try to, to get to all of you with some of these important questions. Um, just a reminder to the audience, if you have a question for any of our panelists, just click on the ask a question there on the bottom and and uh, you're welcome to, to ask anything you'd like. Uh, but let's start with uh, back to Angela. Um, you, in your excerpt, you talked about Ava and, and she's meeting um, one of the other characters. Um, 
I forget his name now. It escapes my, it escapes me. But uh, I'm interested in what's the historical context of your character Ava? What is she fighting to to accomplish throughout the the story? Thank you for that question. Um, I actually wrote the novel uh, with two points of view. So the first point of view, of course, is Eva Cardon. She is um, 24 years old. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her sister and brother-in-law. And she's the owner of um, Chez Genevieve, which is a restaurant that so many of the affluent members of Washington society, both in politics um, and just African-American society in general flock to. And the second point of view is Cortland Hardiman Kingsley IV. He is a senator from Georgia and a war veteran. And he and Eva's paths cross during probably one of the most interesting political times uh, in my mind, uh, the 1948 presidential election. Cortland is on the fast track to um, moving up the ladder from junior senator to um, a presidential hopeful at some point. And so what I'm really trying to try to explore in this book is what happens when two individuals from very different worlds uh, collide as they did at this New Year's Eve party that I read from and how do they make decisions in terms of having a relationship with each other? Cortland's white and she's black. And uh, both of them recognize that they have a lot to lose if they pursue a relationship with each other. Um, the other thing that I'm exploring is the civil rights movement. Um, I was one of those individuals that was really under the assumption that most of the civil rights movement started um, in the late 50s, early 60s, when in fact, I would say civil rights have, has been going on ever since black people landed here, but there was a lot going on in the 1930s and 40s that I tried to explore in the novel. And so you'll see a lot of historical characters like Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and his wife and uh, Mary McLeod Bethune and so many of the others who really uh, foreshadowed what was to happen later on uh, with Dr. King and so many others in the 60s. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful setting, um, not just, you know, to write about parties like, like you read in your excerpt, but um, to raise some really important questions and to build awareness around uh, the civil rights movement that didn't just start when Rosa Parks, you know, refused to get up from her seat, but it's been ongoing. Absolutely. And I learned so much myself, as I said, just doing the research. And I think that's the whole point for me of being a historical fiction writer. I have these natural curiosities that I'm able to explore through the writing of fiction. So it's as much for me as it is for my readers. Definitely. Uh, you muted yourself. Yeah, I can't hear you. Thank you. I was trying, I thought I unmuted myself, <laughs> but thank you for letting me know. Uh, so Vanessa, let's go to you. Um, I want to know more about the, yeah. Repeat the question, I, well, please. Well, I want to know more about the Haitian <laughs> Revolution. It's it's not talked about all that that much, but mm -hmm. really, what I want to know is, who are your main characters that that help you to bring this history to life for us? Yeah, um, the Haitian Revolution is uh, a period in time that has not really gotten the um, the look that it really should and the weight that it needs to be in history. Um, it is phenomenal to think uh, people who are, are enslaved um, literally garnering together and overthrowing a world power. That in itself should be phenomenal. But you've got people who um, some of them are, 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 you know, cannot read French language. French is the language of the of the time. Some of them can't read the French language, and they're having to, you know, send orders to their troops, the massings and whatnot. But most people look at 1791 uh, as the beginning of the revolution. It actually starts 50 about 50 years before that, and it starts with women. 
women had gotten sick and tired of the abuses and they started poisoning people as we do right um and but because it's women no one pays attention to this there was a, the the underpinnings of the society that's yearning for freedom we're yearning there, there's also the the fight between the catholics and the jesuits happening that everybody wants their own rights but can't understand why somebody else wants their own rights so it's this, this 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 pool and so the women have been leading it leading it leading it until you get to the point where um because santa domingo president of haiti is such a valuable co uh, uh, colony everybody wants it france wants it spain wants it those darn new americans want it uh britain wants it and so they begin to say okay um, I will allow you, the blacks to be free, but you got to fight for it with us in order to defeat the other people. And so now the blacks are getting armed. And so that begins this shifting of power, but it's always because people want to possess the land. People want to have these values. At this point in time, $4 out of every $5 is coming from enslavement money, the sugar trade, to, tobacco, indigo. All of these are the on the backs of the labors, primarily from the Caribbean. And so there's these two women that I was drawn to. First of all, most people saw um, Black Panther, you know, kind of forever. Uh, they had these warrior women and they call them the Dory Miage. And then when I was looking behind the scenes, they were actually modeled on the Minos, these warrior women who protected the king in the Dahomey society. I was like, oh, snap, I got to find out more about this. And then I find this woman, Abadoya Toya, who uh, becomes, she's, she's one of the leaders. She's training the women how to fight and whatnot. She gets ensnared and gets it, tricked in, and, and captured in enslavement. And she ends up in Santa Domingo. She ends up raising uh, a young man named Jean-Jacques, Jean-Jacques Desalines, and she teaches him warfare, just like she was training those women back in Africa. She teaches him astrology. She teaches him troop movements. And Jean-Jacques is the man who literally leads the troops, organizes the troops, gets the indigenous, the entire island, even the Tainos up in the mountain. They get them all together and they overthrow the French. And at the same time, uh, born literally the same year uh, is a woman named Mary Claire Bonaire. Mary Claire Bonaire um, wants to make sure people are fed. That is her whole mission. She wants to feed people. And there's this famous battle in uh, 1800, Jacques Mel, where she is on a mule train. Now, first of all, women on a mule train, that should tell you something, right? They're in white. Now, I don't know how you are in white on a mule train, because mules are not clean animals. I'm just putting it out there right here. But anyway, they're on a mule train and they're heading towards the battle. And they just, she just knows that people are going to stop fighting for her because they're on a mule train and they're in white. Personally, I wouldn't have taken those odds. But they stop fighting. And literally she and the women are, they, she didn't care what side, whether you were the French side, whether you were on uh, Toussaint Levator's side. She is binding up these people's wounds and she's preaching to the women on the sidelines. She is the first battlefield nurse. This is this this famous battle is documented in between 18, 1800, 1801. But she becomes Jean Jacques's wife. So you have a woman who is about peace and then you have a mentor mother figure that's about power. And those are the the tensions of as Jean-Jacques tries to form the nation, as he tries to get all these people together, he is constantly moving back between peace and power. And so that's Sister Mother Warrior. Well, that's a great setup. I don't know how anybody could not go and get you go out and get your book after that. <laughs> and you really exemplify what's wonderful about historical fiction. All that research, I mean, you, yeah. all of you are really experts on this subject matter, even though then you, you know, you fictionalize it in order to, to reach more readers. Uh, Kimberly, let's, uh, let's go to you. Um, I'm really curious to know more about the lost colony of Roanoke and who, who was Eleanor Dare, who's featured there in the, in the title. So I think most people, especially if you grew up on the East Coast, learn about the Lost Colony of Roanoke in like fourth or fifth grade. And 
I think we remember it because it's a story without an end. There's no ending. We don't know what happened to these people. And I was a kid who was always into stuff I shouldn't have been into. If there was a room I wasn't supposed to be in or a trail I wasn't supposed to go down. And so I was always kind of obsessed with that story and the idea of it. Um, but I was, it was, I was, this has been about 20 years ago when I found an article that connected it to my home state of Georgia. So there are two mysteries in this book. The first one, The Lost Colony, takes place in 1587. And a man named John White is the governor of the colony. They sail here from England. It's the first um, British colony to come and try and settle with women and children. And of course, before they ever get here, there have been other uh, groups, expeditions who have screwed everything up and been horrible to the, the, the indigenous people who were already here. And I don't know if any of you know this, but the British weren't the first <laughs> to show up here. And so it wasn't, I mean, colonization is not a pretty story, no matter who, who is telling it or how. So they get here and his daughter is Eleanor White Dare. She's um, 19 years old, she's pregnant. And they land on Roanoke Island, which is at the time being called Virginia. Now it's North Carolina coast. And they stopped there because there were other men who had been left behind from other expeditions and they were checking in with them. And the guys that were the captains of the ships said, sorry, folks, you're getting out here. They were supposed to settle further north in Chesapeake Bay. And since they were left on Roanoke Island, things went south very fast. Um, it was very hostile environment. They were unprepared to farm there. They had no idea what they were gonna do. They ran out of supplies really quickly. Eleanor has her baby, her father christens the child, and then they boated the guy off the island and sent him back <laughs> to go get supplies. I don't think they liked John White very much. I don't think he was a very effective leader. So off he goes. And this as the story goes when he comes back three years later because they were at war with the Spanish, so they didn't have ships to send him on for three years. He comes back and everybody's gone. There's, there's a sign that a fort had been built. There were signs that were supposedly agreed upon that say that they moved to another island with some Native Americans that were nearby that were friendly, but nobody really knows. Nobody knows. There's lots of speculation. So 20 years ago, I come across this article and it is about a man who trips over a big rock that's on the side of the highway in Edenton, North Carolina, about 50 miles inland from where that colony should have been. And it has an inscription and he throws it in his trunk. He's on vacation with his wife and they come down into Atlanta and he marches into Emory College and says, so what do you think? Will you pay me? Because it's the end of the depression. So he's hoping to make a buck on this thing. And it was like the heyday for Barnum and Bailey and, you know, all of these spectacles are going on in the United States. And so they take a look at it and all the experts that look at it over the next few years lose their minds because they think it's Elizabethan English and it's a message from Eleanor White there, a survivor of the lost colony, the mother of Virginia there, the daughter of the governor. And it takes a couple of years before it is debunked along with 48 more stones that they have paid for <laughs> and it's all a big hoax but over the years all the experts that have looked at that stone nobody has ever been able to authenticate it or not and so i took that idea and the idea of this 19 year old girl that came probably without a lot of choice in the matter and built a story about her and her descendants and how they might have moved through American history as women, which is a shady business trying to find those ladies underneath. I, I like what Vanessa was saying too. And, you know, trying to find women's history is a little trickier. You have to find it in the, in the creases and the cracks of things. So that's the lost colony. And that's how it relates to this book. Well, it's a, a great idea and such an intriguing story. It sounds like these people were just incredibly passive aggressive and they just decided to get out of there so that, rather than telling John they didn't like him. 
Uh, you know, I think it's funny too, all of the speculation. Um, I always think people think, okay, what happened to the lost colony? And if I've learned anything over my 50 years is I don't think people agree on much of anything. So I don't know. A lot of things might've happened to those people. They may have all gone lots of different directions. So it's interesting to me to try and figure that out and, and to look for the women was really intriguing to me. Yeah, yeah perfect for fiction. You have a, a baseline to go off of, but all that creative freedom then to mm -hmm. go from there. Uh, Aaron, let's move yeah. to the, the history in your story. Um, you talked about in your, your excerpt, uh, Holodomor, um, which I'm really curious to know more about because it is just like all these these stories. It's a, it's a pretty important part of history that we don't hear a lot about. I am a social studies teacher. We cover it for like half a day and we just learned that five million people starved. Uh, so give us a little bit more background on, on what that is, uh, that, that event that's featured in your novel. Well, I'm glad you guys cover that much at least because I don't think I learned that in school. Um, the Holodomor was hidden for so long because of Soviet propaganda. So I'll get into that in a second, but to explain what it is, it was a man-made famine. Holodomor translates into death by hunger. And that's exactly what it was. It was a man-made famine that Stalin implemented to pretty much squash the Ukrainian spirit and eliminate their resistance when he when they didn't comply with collectivization. So he came in in 1929 and uh, made everybody turn in their farm implements, their animals, give up their land to form these state-owned farms. And as you are probably seeing on the news today, the Ukrainian spirit is pretty fierce and they did not want to do that. They were, they wanted to have their own farms and do their own thing. So they resisted. And as you know, a couple of years passed, they kept resisting and he kept doing things to stamp that down. It eventually culminated in this famine that he implemented um, with specific directives for Ukrainians, such as closing down the border of the country so that nobody could leave, locking down villages so that people couldn't go out to find work. And then in the midst of that, sending in these groups of activists, um, which the beginning of which I touched about in an excerpt I read, it got a lot more brutal as those activists came through later. And they would use metal rods and plunge them into beds to look for hidden grain. They would rip apart chimneys if people hid grain in there. They did everything they could to remove every last bit of food from these villagers' homes and then left them to die, locked the country down and left them to die. And that was in going on at the same time as um, this huge deportation of a group of people called the Kulaks, which were essentially, they called them wealthy farmers, but they were really no more wealthy than another farm. They might have a tin roof instead of a straw roof or an extra cow, but it was this whole class that they tried to divide the classes of people against each other. And so they would dekulakize the village and send away all these Kulaks to Gulaks and labor camps or kill them or whatever they needed to do to eliminate the Ukrainian problem and smash that resistance. And it ended up with, you know, close to 4 million people dying. Ukraine lost 13% of its population. One in every eight people died. It was just a brutal, brutal time in a very short period of time. So uh, that is what the historical part of my story centers on. And then I bring in a modern storyline as well with that. Yeah, I mean, just the title, I, I just how you translating it, it makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah, it's just incredible. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so I want to get a little more from each of you. We're moving along here pretty quick. Um, remember, uh, you can ask a question of the panelists. I see we've got one, so we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but let's go back to Angela. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, the sacrifices your characters had to make, or maybe some tough decisions. Um, Tell us a little bit more about what kind of compromises they had to make. And maybe even can you link it to today when I mean, we're still seeing debates about every kind of political issue and sometimes you just have to compromise in order to make progress as you might call it. Absolutely. Um, 1948 was, a, I think, an important time in history because for women specifically, we were just coming off of World War II ending and women having seen what they were capable of because, you know, so many women entered the workforce at this particular time. So I felt like it was a great time to position my character, Eva, because we can explore what it means to be a woman, 
uh, what it means to be um, an, at that time referred to as a Negro woman uh, who is stepping into a role that society at this point still doesn't necessarily think a woman should be stepping into. And Eva is really exploring a lot of what we would consider contemporary um, thoughts about wanting to have a career, not necessarily wanting to be a mother or a wife. And I think we sometimes assume that those mindsets didn't come into play until the late 60s, early 70s. But really, um, within and shortly after World War II, so many women were realizing that they could go in different directions than what society had originally put in place for them. So Eva is really at a point in her life where she sees that she's a very talented business person. And she also sees that the civil rights movement is something that's important to her. And in my research, I saw so many of the women in the movement who, um, similar to in the 60s, were kind of pushed aside and were really asked to play uh, a behind the scenes role. Um, I talk a lot about Adam Clayton Powell Jr., A. Philip Randolph, and some of the other men in the movement. But Mary McLeod Bethune was doing things uh, specifically in Washington, D.C. to push the movement forward that without her and some of the other women, we never would have had the, um, the, the forward movement that we had in the 1960s. Simultaneously, um, some civil rights legislature was put into place by Truman. And that led to the split in the Democratic Party. Um, if you are aware of the Dixiecrats, then you know that um, we didn't just start having political turmoil here of late. It's been with us from the beginning, but it was specifically um, revolving around Truman taking some very um, specific uh, movements to try to make you know the world more uh, beneficial to, to African-American people. So my character, Cortland, is really grappling with how do you remain a Southern Democrat, um, but also push some of the more progressive legislator that was legislation that was happening. So when I had all of those amazing details going on historically, it was really easy to kind of bring my characters into that world and raise the stakes of not just having an interracial relationship, but what does an interracial relationship look like when you really have two people who have some very specific goals and being in a relationship at all was going to be difficult, but being in a relationship with each other was almost impossible. So it was a perfect storm for me to add a lot of tension into an already tense situation. Yeah, I, I can't imagine, um, but you know, it's, it's also great to hear hear your, your, the complexity of it all. And, and I think, again, that's what makes historical fiction so valuable is you're able to put those people inside that complexity and, and make it real. Absolutely. Us. My goal is never to, to change or distort history. I mean, I've read a lot of great books where fiction writers have done that. But for me, it's always, how do I find a way to move in sync with history, but bring in characters that will allow my readers to see it maybe in a way that they wouldn't if they were simply reading it in a history book. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, Vanessa, let's go back to you. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, highlighting women in history, um, but you have some specific, more specific goals in mind in, in hi highlighting the hidden histories of Black women and women of color, emphasizing sisterhood, and dazzling multicultural communities. Can you talk more about that that effort? I try and put into every one of my books. Um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, thinking of being a full time writer um, was a, a lotto ticket. Right? It's one of those magical, mythical. It's a unicorn. It's one of those magical, mythical things that lightning strikes and it happens. So I'm very fortunate to be in the position that I am in. And so when you are in a position of, uh, of, of favor, 
you want to be impactful. So every story I tell needs to leave the reader with a bigger, better understanding of the world they're in, a better understanding of their neighbors and their friends. Um, I champion Black women and women of color because for the most part, particularly when you look at the historical record, you see um, the Jezebel, you see the uh, winch, the enslaved winch, you see uh, the vixen, the evil vixen, taking these men who cannot resist them. There's all these complicated things in history, which some of them are true now. Let's just some of them are true. Uh, but there are stories of women who had integrity or who had deep struggles, who did something extraordinary. Um, my first historical fiction, Dorothy Kerwin Thomas, is a real person who was famous during her time frame, and she was literally erased from the books. A woman who came from enslavement, bought her freedom, bought the freedom of her family, built businesses across the West Indies, and, and saves generational wealth for all women of color and Black women in the colony of Demerara. Her will is archived in the UK, and she was erased. Her story needs to be told. These two women, Abadur Toya, is a child's book that's about 50 pages. And it's it's it doesn't go into the depths of this woman who is ripped away from her home twice. Once to be as a part of the Dahomey tribe and then once to, to be enslaved in Santa Domingue. You never hear that. And then the complexities of Mary Claire Bonner. She's a free woman. Her grandmother um, was in a every one of the colonies, enslavement and being free is different terms. And Sendeming being a French colony, if a Massa or Grand Blanc has a child with an enslaved woman and he recognizes that child, the woman is free and the child is free. So you set up a system for certain inducements of behavior. And her grandmother was one of these women. That's why her line, Mary, Mary Claire Bonaire, is free because of that. Um, and then you have that whole legacy of, uh, you know, colorization and, and the differences in Santa Domingue, Haiti that are still resonating today. Colonization is still resonating today. But these women, you you hear about Toussaint Louverture. You you know about Jean-Jacques Deslines, and probably you've never seen the version of Jean-Jacques Deslines that you will see in in this particular book. And you you know you, you know about Henri Christophe. You know about the men. But this it's, this particular rebellion war is successful because women fought, literally. Abadoria is about 60, 65 years old, and she is leading troops in the in the war getting injured, getting up, and still fighting because she wants the colony to be free. I mean, we need to know this story, but we don't know this story. We know we know the men. The women are never told. And so my goal is to find as many women as possible and return their stories to the world because oftentimes in their day, they are famous. But unfortunately, there's been an effort to systematically wipe out the achievements of these women and reduce them to the lowest degree. Because you can you keep a people from dreaming if you believe that all you've ever been is enslaved. You keep people from coming together if they don't value each other and don't value each other's history. And so those are the messages that I am trying. We are a bigger community. And we are grown enough that we can read the bad, the good, and the ugly, because the bad, the good, and the ugly is on everyone's side. Everybody's hands are stained in these fights. And we all just need to look at the facts and the history and, and go with it. And so that's my mission. Return these stories, return these power women, encourage and enlift on every page, except for the where, where, where they poison it, folks. We don't want to enlift that. I think that's very well said, and I, I applaud you for, for doing that, and I thank you. Um, very quotable. I think I'm going to go back and listen to that and write a few things down. Uh, let's uh, move back to Kimberly. So, Kimberly, we got into the, to the history that, that your story is based off of, but 
um, it's a lot more than just history that you share. Um, you share some really important topics about grief and motherhood and parenting. So can you talk about how you were able to incorporate those um, emotions and real human um, events into your into the history of your story? So the majority of the book is set in 1945, right at the end of World War II. Um, it's a mother and a daughter who are, they are um, part of a family of women that have passed that story of Eleanor Dare down as an oral history, but then also in a book that's been passed through their family. And this is right after those stones that were, that were found in 1937. Oh, am I gone? Yeah, no. you're frozen. I, I don't know if, <laughs> if you're frozen for anybody else, but you're. I'm trying to unfreeze you. I disappeared. I'm back oh, now. Go ahead. Yeah, can yeah, we me? can hear you. So um, the the idea is that they have this book and they have this story, but they don't know if it's true or not. And, and those stones that were found have all been debunked and dismissed. And I, I don't know, something really captivates me about the idea that in, in our families, the stories that we pass down are not always true, especially between mothers and daughters. What we tell our daughters, and we may not even tell them the whole story. Um, we tell them the bits and pieces that they need when we feel they need them. Um, family histories are complicated that way. And sometimes your mother runs out of time before you get the whole story too. So it's about living with what you know and deciding if it matters, if it's true or not. And I kind of, I wanted to look at that in this really small, tight relationship between a young widow at the end of the war, sort of like Eleanor, she's on a precipice, she's at the edge of the map and she's got this 13 year old daughter asking her, who am I? Who are you? Who are we? And then the bigger picture of that was how I see American history from that origin story of colonization and, and throughout. And I'm, I'm a Southern girl and I have this love hate relationship with the South. It's kind of like an abusive parent. It's this charismatic, wonderful thing and it's horrible too. And so I wanted to, to look at all of that within this mother-daughter relationship and what they think about Eleanor and the idea that they've come all the way through all of their American history through these women and these little tidbits that they have in the book, not the whole story, but pieces of it. What can you make of that? How do you live with that? How do you decide who you are in that? And I, you know, it was a different perspective for the mother. Um, than from the daughter and what they made of those stories. Um, and then grief, I think that all, all of the characters in my novel have a loss of some sort. I think survivor's guilt is a big theme in this book. It's a theme in my life. And so it's very relevant in all of the lives of the characters in this book, whether it's there's a man listening to POW messages that may or may not be true. Um, there is a woman who's lost a child. There's a, a woman um, who has lost a mother to mental illness. There's a daughter who's lost a father to in a, Italian POW camps. And then they have Italian POWs who are coming to work on their farm. And they're, all of these people are trying to figure out, and maybe this is a bigger metaphor for me and what's going on in my head right now, how do you all sit down at the table together? How do you do that now? Who's the enemy? Who, who's your friend? Um, how do you live with your choices and the things that you've done in your past? And, and how do you make a home out of that again? So those were the themes that went into this book. I think that's what your question was about. Yeah, no, you, you raised a lot of really important questions and things that, you know, at, on some level we can all relate to. And I love what you said about living with what you know and also, you know, kind of confronting this love-hate relationship, um, you know, with, with your home. 
Uh, Kimberly, I'm going to I'm going to kick you off the screen here for a second because you're frozen. At least you're frozen when I'm looking at you. Um, so I'm going to ask Aaron a question and then I'll try to bring you back on. Uh, so, Aaron, um, we actually have a question directed at you in our um, from the audience. And looks like Amanda asks, did you always plan for the story to be a dual point of view with a modern day timeline? And why did you make that narrative choice? I did. Um, I have always been fascinated with, and I think I'm seeing a lot of this theme with our other panelists here, how history affects the present. And I really wanted to explore that in a family. How does that past grief and trauma that somebody went through uh, you know, decades ago, how does that affect the grandchildren, the great grandchildren, how does that echo? And so I wanted to show that with the, the, dual, the dual timeline. And I also wanted to, to highlight that, that family connection, like how important it is to, to know your, your family's history, to know what your family went through, because those things help shape us, whether you realize it or not, everything they have been through before us in some way affects us. And so that was important to me to highlight. And, and that was why I chose to do a dual timeline in that regard. And I also wanted to bring in a little bit of not so heavy because the Holodomor was so, so heavy and so dark. Um, I wanted to be able to show a little bit of that hope in another way. I try to give hope at the end of the story, even for my historical characters, but it's, it's a hard thing to do when they lost so much. So it was twofold why I did that. Can you talk a little more about your own family's connection to this history? And then, of course, um, you know, no one can be happy about what's happening in the Ukraine, um, but it does bring attention to what what you're writing about. Um, and I and I know on the cover of your book, you 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 have proceeds are given to a certain um, charity. So, can you, can you talk about those two things? Your your connection, you know, why you. What, what you had envisioned when you started this out and, and where it's at now with uh, contributing to the people in Ukraine? Sure. So I started, you know, I had a fascination with all things Ukrainian from a very young age because my great grandmother lived with us when I was young and I grew up learning those traditions and hearing different stories from her. So as I got older and started, I've always loved history. I started researching to try and fit our family into that history. I wanted to see where those stories fit into that the, the true historical narrative of Ukraine. And I started with World War II because my family lived under the Soviet oppression. They lived under the Nazi regime and they escaped in World War II in a wagon, traveling across Europe before living in displaced persons camps for a couple of years and then immigrating to America. And so initially I wanted to write that story. That was going to be a novel loosely based on what my family went through. Um, but as I did that research and went further back, I learned more about the Holodomor and how intentional it was and how devastating it was. And there, and there were certain things that I hadn't fully grasped. And as I understood more about it, I thought, I have to start here. This is a story that has been hidden and not told very much at all. And so I, I wanted to start there first. And so actually book two, which will come out next year, is going to pull more from my family's journey and um, that refugee situation that they went through. So with book one being on the Holodomor and coming out now, uh, you know, I've been working on it on and off for 10 years, probably. It's been a side thing that I've tried to do when I can. I, you know, like it was mentioned earlier, being a full-time writer, like it's a, it's a dream and it was a pipe dream I always had. Um, so I chipped away at it and finally got it to this point. And for it to come out now while this invasion in Ukraine is occurring has been, it's been surreal. So I was thrilled that my publisher approached me with the idea of wanting to contribute. I was contributing personally and doing things anyways, but them saying that they wanted to contribute a share of their proceeds of the book as well, it was just amazing. So it's been really gratifying to know that in, in some small way for people who read my book, I'm shedding a little bit of light on this tragic history that Ukraine has with Russia that a lot of people don't realize. They think, you know, it all started at the fall of the Soviet Union. It's it's pretty recent, but it goes back for centuries. They have been warring over this land. So to highlight that a little bit, a bit of that history, and then to maybe be able to give a little bit of money to Ukraine and help them rebuild and, and fight off what they can, it's been really gratifying that my publishers helped me do that. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. 
Uh, well, we're up against the clock here. I, I want to respect everyone's time. Um, before we go, I, I want to give everyone a chance to put in a, a final word. Um, I want to remind people, well, first of all, thank you panelists for being here. I want to thank the audience for attending. Um, the replay will be available at this same URL um, indefinitely. Um, I'm also going to put it up on YouTube and it's up on Facebook so that people can watch the replay and uh, and still they can get, get these books. So if you want to pick up a copy, click on get your book at the bottom of the screen there. And that actually goes to um, bookshop.org, which is um, they, they give part of the sale to um, independent bookstores. So that's really great. Um, but before we leave, first, Kimberly, I'm sorry for kicking you off the screen. You're, you're back now, so I feel bad about that. Um, but let me just ask uh, for each of you, why historical fiction? What is the value of telling this history through fiction, as our press is called? Um, Kimberly, let's start with you. I, I think Vanessa said it beautifully before. Um, she was talking about stories that have, that have been lost or people that have been erased and voices that have not been heard. And I think as a writer, you, I don't know why we, why writer brains are aware of those stories more than just a, an average person. I, I find that when I have a conversation with another writer, especially a historical fiction writer, but not always, that's the stories that we gravitate to. And maybe it's because what she said, we, we know that we have the mic. You have your moment to, to write it down, to, to make it real, to make it something that, that you hope will last and be heard, even if just for a moment. And so there feels to me like this um, gravitas to that, that it's a responsibility to, to somehow say something that was silenced before in some way um, and, and give it a moment. I think the things that have been silenced are usually the things that we should be listening to. So maybe that's where it comes from. Yeah, that's, that's great and very well said. Uh, Angela, any final thoughts for you about the, the value of historical fiction? Absolutely. Um, our world has become so polarized. It's, it's difficult for us to have even the simplest of conversation. Um, initially, I wanted to be a history uh, major, but I realized I love making up stories too. So this was a great marriage between the two worlds. And I do believe that in many cases, literature can be that bridge that maybe we don't have right now in terms of how do we talk about complicated, difficult topics. And so every book that I write, I attempt to explore topics that have a historical origin, but are also still relevant for the times that we're living in. So I think um, being a historical fiction writer gives me the best of both worlds. I can tell the truth, but I can also uh, tell it with um, a, a, a sprinkle of fiction that maybe makes it go down a little easier. Yeah, and, and I can tell you that I was a history major and I, I moved towards fiction for that reason. Uh, Aaron, how about you? Any final words on the, the value of historical fiction? I don't know what I can say. They've said it all so well, but I, I agree. Yeah, I, I was a history major as well, but historical fiction will always have my heart because I think it, it makes it accessible. It's a gateway for people to really jump in and find out what intrigues them and learn more, and then hopefully go on to learn even more if they want to. So it's, I think it's a beautiful union of two great things, writing and, and history. I think that's a really good point that it leads you to, to learn more. Um, it happens all the time when I read historical fiction. Well, I'm Googling stuff all the time and, I, and then I start reading more books about it. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, Vanessa, I'll let you do the mic drop here. Just from the panelists, Angela is doing a deep dive into the Washington history, the politics that are going on 1940s timeframe. We don't really know that much. 
we know the 60s um kimberly is taking us to the lost rona because we all got that one story we're like well what happened right and then with the, the everything in ukraine that is happening is so prescient we weren't taught the famines we knew that there were aggression uh, russian aggressions against the ukrainian people but but in when i was in school we weren't taught that um and so these gateways of things you you never imagined never thought of historical fiction plays such an important role. It's a, no one wants to read encyclopedias. You know, they, they don't want to go and pull it, you know, they will Google for five minutes uh, and Wikipedia for five minutes and, and whatnot. But to get the heart of what was happening, to understand in the global perspective, that's what historical fiction does best. It makes it relatable. It makes everybody human. And you can empathize with people who don't look like you. You can empathize with stories that aren't your stories, or you can find your ancestors in a way that you've never found before by going with historical fiction. So I love it. I feel very privileged to be a part of it. And I think the ladies here also agree. It, we're privileged to be able to tell these stories and we do our hard work. We do a lot of research. You know, um, I, I saw one of the questions, I'm not from the 1800s but I've read 10,000 books from the 1800s. I do exhaustive research on every part. My books are diverse. I make sure I nail everybody who's in that perspective. Historical figures that may show up, we go and we read other things. We read their own words. And then we read people who look like them telling, talking about them so that we get that, that additional perspective. And so, you're looking at a lot of hard work and labor uh, that gets fit between 100 to 150,000 words. You get more take. Um, but it's important. And we, we bless you. We thank you guys for buying our books. Tell the world um, because that keeps us going, that keeps the publishers going. Um, and it's a beautiful place. Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, uh, more really good points. It is exhaustive. I think Aaron said. She's been working on hers for 10 years, and um, it's really just, we're just also grateful anytime a reader can pick up and, and, and learn something and enjoy a, enjoy a story as well, and maybe maybe relate to it. Uh, so thank you all, all of you so much. This was so much fun. I'm so glad that we could, could do this, and congratulations on your books. Thank you. thank you. All right, well, good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.